Living in Virginia, you're in the fast lane on the information superhighway. We've invested $3 billion in Virginia's broadband network to give you one of the fastest internet connection speeds in the world. So you can build relationships, bring new business to our state, and meet the future of education. It's amazing what we can do together. Visit VCTA.com to learn how broadband connects the Commonwealth. From the General Assembly and the City of Richmond, I'm Woody Evans for Cable Reports, brought to you by the Virginia Cable Telecommunications Association and Cox Communications, connecting Virginians to their government. We're so pleased to have Senator Linwood Lewis with us today. Welcome, Senator. Thank you, Woody. Good to be with you. Uh, next week is crossover, but I understand things are going uh, pretty well on the Senate side. Yeah, we uh, started out at a pretty fast clip for a long session and uh, have been working through some uh, very fat committee dockets. I think there's been a 25 percent increase in legislation filed this year uh, on both uh, cumulatively on both sides and uh, the Senate uh, was uh, had a brisker pace of legislation as well so but we were, we're handling it well. I understand the House may be a little more challenged but we're doing all right on our the side. House has 19 new members to all freshmen so that that tends to increase the number of bills and they've got to learn the rules. Yes. A uh, huge uh, landslide there that I'm sure you, you predicted that Democrats would pick up 15 new seats in the House of Delegates. My jaw was on the floor election <laughs> night. Yeah, it really was. But, I mean, it was a good night uh, for, for my team. Uh, and we do have some very bright, energetic folks on the other side uh, full of ideas. And I think that has resulted in a dramatic increase in legislation on the House side. Uh, one significant change uh, on your side, uh, you have a new lieutenant governor. We do. Uh, lieutenant Governor Fairfax, Justin Fairfax, who is doing an excellent job. Uh, the parliamentary rules, the, the primary job of the lieutenant governor is to preside over the Senate. And uh, the parliamentary rules can be somewhat arcane and obtuse. Uh, and somehow, in a very short period of time between election day and the first day of the session, he's uh, mastered them quite well. So. Uh, that's amazing because he has to deal with uh, the majority leader a lot in, in terms of those rules, uh, Tommy Norman, who has been around for quite a while. Senator Norman is a master uh, of the parliamentary rules and procedures. And yes, uh, occasionally, uh, it hasn't happened so far, but I'm sure in this session it will happen. There will be some sort of dust up where there will uh, be an interpretation of the rules that needs to be made that uh, Senator Norman may not agree with. So uh, your district hasn't changed. Uh, we're, we're, we'll wait until uh, 2020 uh, to do that one, one more time. But yeah. uh, you, you have a, a, a very diverse district in, in terms of demographics, economics, Absolutely. and geography. Talk to us about uh, that district. All, all those things. We have uh, uh, the two counties on Virginia's eastern shore, where I actually live, half the city of Norfolk, one precinct in Virginia Beach, and then we go up to the Middle Peninsula and bring in Matthews County, where I just had a town hall last uh, last Wednesday. So. Uh, talk to us about that town hall. What, what were your constituents most concerned about? Well, mostly local issues, uh, pr uh, predominantly dredging issues. Uh, there's a real crisis in coastal Virginia uh, with dredging. The federal government has pulled back dramatically uh, from its dredging uh, responsibilities and its dredging activities. The state hasn't ever really embarked on any dredging, and so actually we have a bill in this year to create a uh, a waterways maintenance fund for commercial dredging and, and we're hoping through the budget and budget amendments to actually have that funded for, for some local dredging projects. So that's an important issue for them. So I take it that, that that's, that's a pretty big economic issue. Yes, it's huge. Uh, and, and on the eastern shore, as well as Matthews County, uh, the Coast Guard's actually been pulling up uh, markers uh, because the shoaling is such that the markers are not reliable anymore and uh, they don't want the responsibility uh, of, of having the markers out there that are that are not pro they don't properly indicate the channel so it's a huge issue of course in terms of high tech you've got wallops island in, in your district uh, how important is that for nasa facility there oh it would hugely uh, important of tremendous importance not only obviously to my district but also to the commonwealth as a whole 
um, the potential there is again just being scratched uh, and uh, we're going to do great things there. We're still supplying the International Space Station uh, from the uh, uh, Space Authority launches and then Wallops has its own missions uh, for NASA uh, as well. So it's a great symbiotic uh, relationship going on there and now and of course now we're into unmanned aerial systems. We've got a, a, a airstrip there for unmanned aerial systems which uh, the Commonwealth invested in and uh, that industry as well is, is posed to, to really explode. So I take it that <clears throat> that facility has a ripple effect in terms of the economy? Yes, it does, and we, we haven't fully realized it uh, yet. Uh, the tricky part there is we have, to, we have to compete with our neighbors to the north in Maryland, uh, and uh, particularly when it comes to school systems. Uh, they invest more in teacher pay, and they invest more in their system of public education, and that's always a, a big decision maker when families are looking to locate to a new area. So we're, we're, we're keenly aware of that and hope we, can, uh, hope we can redress that a little bit. And of course the other major uh, impediment from time to time is the federal government in terms of, in terms of funding. I believe uh, by Thursday of this week there has, there has to be at least another continuing resolution yes. to fund uh, federal government activities. Yes, and that, that's a problem for us in the Commonwealth as a whole. You know, we, uh, Governor McAuliffe spent four years talking about working on the new Virginia economy because of our over-reliance on federal spending and defense spending in particular. And so anytime we get into one of these budget showdowns, which is a prime example of the dysfunction in Washington that we need to really work to avoid here in Richmond, when we get to one of those, the economic consequences for the Commonwealth are pretty, pretty dramatic. Now, uh, uh, the Navy is, 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 is a huge economic driver, especially in the city of Norfolk and surrounding areas. Talk to us about what facilities exist there and why they are important. Yeah, uh, again, hugely important there, a tremendous part of the Hampton Roads economy. We also have, you mentioned Wallops Island, there's a Navy facility on Wallops Island uh, to deal with, the, to uh, do practice uh, with the Navy's missiles, missile defense systems. Uh, they've got a tremendous infrastructure investment there as well as personnel. So, uh, you know, we're, we, we love our Navy. Uh, we're glad it's there. It's a tremendous part of our economy, but again, we can't be overly reliant on it. Uh, but there are things we are doing uh, to try and make sure the Navy stays, and one of those things is addressing sea level rise and recurrent flooding, particularly in Norfolk, uh, but in, throughout all of Hampton Roads, because obviously that poses some, some strategic threats uh, for the Navy going forward. So it's a public safety issue as well as a potential national security issue. It is. Uh, economic development, public safety, quality of life, all of those things, uh, and not just the impact, potential impact it could have on the Navy when it chooses to either relocate bases, relocate facilities, reallocate existing assets, uh, but also whether they uh, uh, want to improve upon assets that they have in place. Uh, and businesses as well. If they're going to locate into a, in, in a community, it is no secret that Hampton Roads is the second largest population in the United States affected by sea level rise. Uh, and so we have to send a clear signal uh, to the world uh, that we are serious about uh, dealing with it. Lots of bridges and tunnels that, especially the tunnels, yes. uh, get flooded during heavy rains. Absolutely. Uh, it is, uh, I think, the last statistic I heard uh, that there are uh, 10 to 12 days a year when the road to uh, Norfolk Naval Station uh, is impassable. Uh, and that's just not acceptable. And that's only going to get worse. Uh, and so we need to, the, the Navy is serious about it. Every plan that they make or have uh, in regards to their assets and their infrastructure uh, builds in sea level rise considerations. Uh, to what extent does offshore drilling or the potential for that have on sea level rise? Uh, well, it, it, it has a, a very potential, uh, negative potential uh, right. impact on, on our Navy and our military presence. The Navy is not thrilled with the idea of offshore, nor is Wallops Island and the spaceport uh, thrilled with that either. They have a zero tolerance for these rocket launches, uh, and so it would drive up the cost for commercial launches and, and, and give, put them at a competitive disadvantage. Uh, we've also got an aquaculture industry, which is huge mm -hmm. and growing. Uh, uh, we are the lead on the East Coast in aquaculture production and growing and so anything on the seaside uh, of the eastern shore uh, that could potentially pose a threat to water quality uh, is not acceptable. So is there the need for a cabinet level position at, at the state level to deal with these issues? Yes, absolutely and uh, for the second year in a row uh, Delegate Stolle on the House side and I have on the Senate side put in a bill to establish a cabinet level position um, and 
we are confident that we will come away this year with something. Uh, it may be uh, not a cabinet secretary, but it may be a cabinet level uh, flooding and resiliency uh, officer to deal with these things. Someone who gets up every morning and when their feet hit the floor, they are working with localities, interacting with the federal government to find funding, working with the localities to identify projects. It, and again, it sends a tremendous message. You know, Moody's, uh, when they reviewed our bond uh, rating this year, Virginia, of course, continues its uh, AAA bond rating from all rating agencies, had a caveat in there. And one of the caveats is that they were going, uh, the caveat was that they were going to start with all the reviews uh, of uh, all localities and states, how are you dealing with resiliency and, and flooding and sea level rise? And so, so why is that bond rating so important to the Commonwealth? Well, it, 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 it dramatically impacts how we are able, how cheaply we are able to borrow money, not only at the Commonwealth level, but it also uh, goes down to our localities. Our localities, when they borrow money, benefit from the state's AAA bond rating. Uh, and so uh, can have a tremendously a negative impact on our ability to borrow at favorable rates, and in addition, it's just a it's, it's just a prime indicator of of how sound your state is when you get a triple A rating from all three agencies, which we have had since the agencies have been in existence. So. And of course, the uh, second largest revenue driver for the Commonwealth in your district is the Port of Virginia. Yes, absolutely, and again, another great asset. And and, and again, talking about sea level rise and resiliency, the port. When you talk to John Reinhardt, he will tell you in no uncertain terms the port also is concerned about sea level rise, flooding, and resiliency because uh, the shipping industry is unforgiving and they depend on getting goods and services from point A to point B. And when you cease to be able to do that in a competitive or efficient way, they punish you by going elsewhere. And so, again, that's why it's very important. There's been some major investments made there at, at, at the Port of Virginia over the last few years. Uh, besides the, the dredging, I think there's some, uh, uh, some new cranes that have yes. been brought on board to deal with the type of cargo that comes off of those post-Panamax ships now. We had a $350 million investment last year, and we're looking at another significant investment this year uh, to start the dredge process. Uh, 55 and 5, I think, was the, was the old byword, uh, and we need to do that. Other states are, are catching up with our God-given competitive advantages to the depth of our channel. We need to go deeper, and we need to do it yesterday. Uh, and so we're trying to get that started. We can't wait for the federal government. It's also important to be as wide as possible because then you don't have a bottleneck, so to speak, yes. when vehicles need to get in and out. And also the Navy needs that ability to, trans to transit. Yes, a very important issue, and I think we're going to deal favorably with it during this General Assembly in the budget. Uh, what about uh, rail from uh, the port up to uh, the inland port in uh, from Royal Virginia, and w what impact that has, not only on the Commonwealth, but throughout the nation? Yeah, our ability to get into the heartland, and we invested in the heartland corridor a few years ago, that is raising the uh, underpasses and overpasses so that we can double stack on these trains and, and get into the, the heartland of America uh, and, and be more competitive in that regard has, has yielded some great results. And the inland port at Front Royal, again, another tr uh, very important asset for the Commonwealth. Now you've uh, dealt with some issues, or at least your colleagues have over the last few years about tolling, uh, especially in the Hampton Roads area. I understand that uh, Gov Governor McAuliffe was, was able to buy down those tolls to uh, alleviate the uh, the pressure on people who use those uh, uh, those bridges, uh, especially. Was that a permanent solution or only temporary? It was only a temporary solution, unfortunately. Uh, terrible deal. Um, the Elizabeth River Crossings project was uh, a terrible example of public, I believe strongly in uh, public-private partnerships. I think they have a great role to play in build out of, of big infrastructure projects. That was a terrible deal. Uh, and the governor tried all four for throughout his four-year term to uh, lessen the negative impact on folks who are regular commuters between Portsmouth and Norfolk. Uh, these are working folks uh, and this, uh, this toll was uh, just overly burdensome on them and unfortunately a deal is a deal and unless uh, and until we are able to throw more Commonwealth resources at it, uh, we're going to be stuck with it uh, after this buy down. And of course, that has to have a negative impact on commerce, especially businesses and different sides of, different sides of that river. Sure, decisions are made based on those, the costs of, of transport and are, are getting your people to and from work and things of that nature. And you, sometimes you risk, you could risk the um, the uh, 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 
balkanizing essentially Portsmouth mm -hmm. uh, from from uh, commerce, and so that's not a good result. So we we need to continue, and I'm sure Governor Northam will, and during his four-year term, continue to look for ways that we can better that deal uh, for our residents. Any more sympathy from uh, your uh, colleagues in Northern Virginia since they are starting to feel the impact of? Uh, of high tolls, they they have uh, they certainly have had some eye popping uh, tolls. I've seen the pictures of the signs uh, and giving the rates on the hot lanes up there. But uh, they've had a couple of bills in, and I'm not sure on the house side that I think are going to may make their way over to the Senate. I'm not sure, but uh, had, that that sympathy has not bled over to us in Hampton Roads as of yet. But uh, it certainly should. We would be remiss if we didn't talk about uh, uh, the uh, uh, the agriculture and uh, forestry industry, which is another huge economic driver for, for the Commonwealth. And, and you represent a number of rural counties. Absolutely. On the eastern shore, uh, one of the prime agricultural producing uh, localities, the two counties on Virginia's eastern shore in the Commonwealth. So agriculture is very important. And again, as you pointed out, a huge industry in the Commonwealth, ag and forestry combined. And so we're doing everything we can to facilitate and encourage that, uh, again, as we seek to uh, lessen our reliance, put all our eggs in one basket with the federal government. Uh, ag and forestry offers us uh, another avenue. Uh, Governor McAuliffe, uh, during his term, uh, really bolstered uh, with Secretary uh, Haymore and Secretary of Agriculture Haymore, really bolstered our exports, ag exports. Uh, and I'm sure, again, looking forward to Governor Northam continuing to do that. So what kind of farming is, is done in, in those rural uh, counties that you represent? Got corn, soybeans, uh, wheat, the tr traditional crops. Uh, we still have some tomato production there, although that's pulled back a little bit. Um, so we, we've, it's, it's, it's a pretty diverse group. So a lot of export internationally, I take it, especially for corn and soybeans. Yep, and, and we, but we have a large poultry industry, and that actually can consume a lot of our grain uh, for feed. Um, and, and a poultry industry, frankly, that's, that's really exploded somewhat over the last couple of years with some investments in some new uh, grower houses. And, and, and so we've seen a significant increase in poultry. And I understand that uh, we uh, continue to export wood chips to uh, the United Kingdom, for example. Yeah, absolutely. It, and looking forward to exporting more. Yeah. Uh, uh, agriculture, at least the committee, also takes into uh, consideration the Chesapeake Bay. And so there are a lot of environmental issues. We, we've talked about sea rise issues, but what other issues exist there? Well, and again, it, it, the Bay, writ large, is, is a huge part of our Commonwealth's history, our culture, uh, certainly the culture of my district and the history of my district, and so we're very concerned about the health of the Bay. It has been improving. Uh, we made a trem tremendous uh, investment over the last decade in um, uh, uh, sewage treatment remediation sewage plants. Uh, Stormwater is, uh, is the next big challenge. We've also got to come up with sustainable funding for agricultural best management practices. It's been a real peaks and valleys uh, funding stream for the last few years, and we're working on that this session in this budget, uh, and hopefully we'll, we'll be able to do that. Um, but all those things together, it's, it's not going to be cheap and it's not going to be easy, but we've seen progress uh, in, uh, we've certainly we've got federally mandated uh, goals that we have to hit, and so far we're ahead of, ahead of where we need to be. Now you have Old Dominion University in Norfolk. I think Norfolk State is there. There's also a medical school there, is there? Eastern Virginia Medical School, yes, absolutely. And uh, very proud of all those institutions. Uh, what about at the local level? How are your school districts doing? Not only there in the urban areas, but, but, but in the counties you represent. All, you know, people often ask how, how you represent such a diverse district. Uh, but I will tell you that particularly when it comes to the school systems, uh, economically challenged rural areas and inner city schools have a lot in common mm. and a lot of the same issues and so we're dealing with a lot of those same issues within this district. Uh, Norfolk schools uh, have, have, have improved or showing improvement. Uh, there's still some things we, we can obviously work on uh, but you know people forget that the public school system in, in the Commonwealth they have to take all comers uh, and, and, and so, you know, we have to be cognizant of that fact uh, and, and give them the resources that they need in order to meet their mission. What about funding for uh, pre-kindergarten? How important uh, in, in your perspective is that? I think, it's, I think it's very important and I know Governor Northam has always been committed to that so I'm a 
hopeful that, that in his four-year term we're going to find some new ways to, to devote more state resources to helping localities expand pre-K programs. In Europe, uh, it is done everywhere. Uh, and if we're going to be competitive internationally, we have to do what the other folks are doing in regards to our system of education. And certainly expanding pre-K is one of those fundamental things that must be done. I think we're starting to take some other lessons from our friends in Europe, and that has to do with apprenticeships, especially when it comes to trades. Uh, they've been, for some reason, suffering from an unwarranted stigma over the last 30 to 40 years, but now that seems to be turning around. It, it has definitely reversed, and it's, it's done so within the last decade. Uh, people are realizing we have a real uh, trained worker shortage in a lot of the trades uh, and that people can, can live great lives and provide for their families and expand opportunity for their children by working in the trades. And so that's been a great sea change, I think, uh, in our system of education. And so we are devoting more resources uh, to, to the trades and to vocational uh, training within our school systems, and I think that's vital going forward. What about uh, dual enrollments between high schools and the community colleges? And that has been very successful, uh, and, and we need to encourage more uh, of that. But it, that has been a very successful program. Now, you've got to have a lot of military uh, constituents in, in your district. How are we dealing with our military, especially those who are coming back from theaters of war, who have uh, uh, garnered a lot of different experience and training that uh, uh, they should be able to garner employment with. Absolutely, and over the last few years we've, we've started some innovative programs to try and give uh, folks credit for the skills that they've uh, honed and developed in the military. Uh, we've also got Virginia Values Veterans uh, Program, which encourages employers to hire uh, veterans and gives them tax credits for hiring veterans. Um, so we're doing a lot. We're being very proactive and have been in recent years uh, with how we how we try to encourage uh, our military folks to get back or to to stay here, uh, and to put those skills that they've used to work here in the Commonwealth. So, so in other in other words, if if I've driven a truck in in Afghanistan, Mosul, for example, to to one of the other war torn cities for a couple of years, and I come back here. Uh, there should be no question about my ability to get a commercial driver's license. Exactly. We want to facilitate any skill, and that's a perfect example, uh, to facilitate the entry, re-entry into civilian life of someone who has spent and developed those types of, of skills in the military. So you're right, there should be, it should be very easy for somebody with that kind of background to get a commercial driver's license. In the same vein, if I've been a corpsman or a medic and I come back, uh, uh, I should be able to get credit for that experience. Absolutely. And that's what we're... We're, we're trying to do that now in the Commonwealth. Uh, Health care is still a big issue. I don't know to what extent the opioid crisis has affected uh, your district. It, it has affected my district uh, and affects it even in greater every day, unfortunately. I have a bill in this year which is gaining some steam to allow localities to create uh, overdose uh, review panels because each one of these tragedies is really a teachable moment. Each one's unique and so this puts together a group of stakeholders across jurisdictional boundaries between counties and cities uh, and lets them examine in great detail the individual incident and the individual who died and see if there are things that they can learn whether it's through enforcement uh, or if they can learn uh, prevention uh, where the holes are in the community safety net all of those things and it's vital that they be able to come together like this modeled after a program in Maryland which has been very successful. Of course it's a criminal justice question but it's also a, a, a health issue, a huge health issue. Oh a absolutely and that's why uh, these review panels have they have people from uh, enforcement and from the Commonwealth Attorney's Office but they also have folks on there from the Community Services Board and even the school system uh, to do a, to a holistic examination of, of what led to each individual tragedy. Uh, Medicaid is still on the agenda. As a result of the changes in the House of Delegates, uh, there appears to be at least some room for a compromise. Uh, 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 the, uh, the Speaker of the House recently sent a letter to Governor Northam indicating that uh, there was potential for com compromise based upon uh, a, a work requirement being imposed uh, upon expansion. Where are you on that issue? Right. I have always been in support of expansion. Uh, I think rarely in public life have I seen uh, what is fiscally prudent, what is good economic development, and what is good health policy as well as what is morally right all coalesce uh, in, in one policy decision, and that is the need to expand Medicaid. We, had, we came up with a compromise proposal my first year in the Senate 
Uh, it was a Republican drawn proposal uh, called Marketplace Virginia. Uh, and it had a lot of the reforms that, uh, uh, that some of the folks on the House side now are asking for. And so may, that may well be where we end up. Uh, my guess is going to be that we will see some sort of expansion, and, but we'll probably see it very late in this session. And, of course, the uh, co-chair of the Senate Finance Committee, Senator Hanger, has always been supportive of expansion. Yes, he has. And Senator Hanger, again, to his credit, had a bill in uh, this year uh, which didn't make it out of the committee. Uh, but which uh, in many respects uh, reflected the agreements that we had uh, with Marketplace Virginia a few years ago. Uh, 2020 will be upon us before we know it and you'll be in the middle of redistricting. Uh, what about redistricting reform? Yeah, I had a couple of bills in this year which uh, died on a tie vote, uh, which is probably the most frustrating way to, uh, to die. Uh, and, uh, but we have had one bill get out uh, that is a, what's called a criteria bill, and that uh, gives some guidance going forward to how, w what, what standards we should use to draw these maps. And it's, it's a step forward. It's not as big a step forward as I would like, but it is a step forward. We're going to see a court decision any day now uh, that is going to mandate, uh, I think by everyone's estimation, going to mandate the redrawing of uh, several of our house districts, if not all of our house districts. And uh, we need to have some criteria in place. Interesting you mentioned that because the other Supreme Court decision that's pending is one where they are looking at for the first time in literally decades uh, the question of partisan politics yes. in the redistricting process. Yes. Uh, that's going to be interesting to see what comes out of that. Always been racial gerrymandering, but now we are looking at partisan gerrymandering as well. Uh, and the, I, th I think the trend in the court systems at all levels, uh, the trend is clear. Uh, and we need to be proactive in Virginia on that. Now, what about absentee voting? I know you've still been active in, in, in that arena as well. Mm -hmm. Yep, support absentee, support no excuse absentee voting. Uh, there's no reason we should not make voting as easy as, as possible in this free democratic society in which we live. We've spent a lot of time uh, in Richmond in recent years talking about what impediments we can put uh, in, in front of people trying to get to the polls, but we need to go in the opposite direction on that. It needs to be easier. Where is restoration of civil rights that, it, that, that relates to felons' rights to vo right to vote? Right. Governor Northam has indicated that he is going to follow uh, Governor McAuliffe in, in being, having a very robust restoration program within his secretary of the Commonwealth Secretariat. Uh, Governor McAuliffe, I think, restored far and above uh, more rights than anybody else. And so that's going to go on. I still think we need a statutory uh, fix to this. I think we need to uh, have an automatic, some sort of automatic restoration with some possible exceptions uh, so that you don't have to have this uh, shop in the governor's office uh, working night and day trying to restore people's rights once they've paid their debt to society. Great. Well, thank you for uh, taking the time to sit down with us to, uh, to address these issues. Senator Linwood Lewis, good thank to you, see you. Woody. Thank you for watching Cable Reports, brought to you by the Virginia Cable Telecommunications Association and Cox Communications. Until next time, I'm Woody Evans. Mm-hmm.